Well, this array uh, is to really um, explain something about the readiness to receive fairy tales in the service of the self. Um, it is open my mind as is uh, possible. As it comes, uh, I brought it because of my own personal experience recently when I was exposed to um, avant-garde music in Cambridge Kettle Yard Conference of Patterns in Connections and Connections. And the first time I saw this exhibition, which was by a man called Loza, Zurich, a whole series of them using primarily the colour circle of Goethe, having added two colours. My first experience of it was, my God, what do we have now? Kettle's Yard is a very lovely place, and if you come to Cambridge, it's worth visiting. It's the house, was the house of a man called Jim Ead, who collected, who collected. And the house is kept in the style in which he left it, so it still feels homely, with beautiful <coughs> things in it. And a more recent addition is a modern gallery where all sorts of things are exhibited, and often rare things. This this man has only been exhibited, I think, twice in England, and just recently once in a London uh, gallery and once in Cambridge. And it was in connection with this that we had the symposium on patterns of connection. If you don't hear me, please say so. There's no point in sitting, uh, you know, not hearing, mm -hmm. and I can raise my voice. Um, I realized yes. at that yes. time... Some, some is indicating, please, if you could raise your voice. Oh, at, at, it was through that experience of first saying, my God, what next? And my second experience, when I saw them the second time, suddenly realizing that for me they uh, came across as patterns of music. So clearly something had shifted in myself, and I could then proceed very productively and pleasantly to appreciating uh, avant-garde music, which I had not heard before, or at least if I'd heard it, I hadn't realized what it was. So I brought it along as an um, invitation, really, to you to, um, to consider that when we do use fairy tales, stories, legends, and other things in the service of the self, we need to approach these tales with an open mind, but not discarding the magic which we felt if we have heard them before in childhood or since. Actually the one I'm using is a modern fairy tale, the one I'm going to talk about is a modern fairy tale, so there are no associations to the, to the tale, but I think you'll find some associations to the content. The reason for um, this is, an, is another exhibit in the present uh, exhibition at Kettle's Yard, and it's called Sacrifice. It's worth your while looking at it afterwards. You can't all get it. I suppose we can hold it up. I think the easier people is to look at it afterwards. Yes, mm -hmm. it, that is the exhibition is in the gallery, and there's the book underneath it about it. It's called um, Metaphor, Form and Metaphor or form as metaphor. And in the church, which is being used by a kettle's yard, a church that's not in use, very beautiful small church with Norman origin, um, we were told there was a sculpture which we could go and see if we borrowed the key. So I borrowed the key and went in. I wonder where is this sculpture? And I was expecting something like a sculpture. Um, and found myself facing this enormous structure in the tower space. And I thought, well, now what is going on here? And was about to turn my back on it, well, not quite, but uh, metaphorically speaking. And then I looked at it a little longer, and I found that for me, and I'm not primarily a visual person, I'm much more auditory than acoustic, than visual, Suddenly there emerged some sense out of it and I got in touch with a deeper layer of my uh, self. This other one there, which is very worldly, is the place of the, the family of the Northumberlands in Sion Park. 
Um, an old stable, the actual building is not that old, it goes back a few centuries, interiorly designed almost entirely by Adams. The family live there, but they, leave, they have left the periphery, and you can walk around the private quarters, for us to see, and even to sit on the chairs, which is very rare. We were invited to sit if we wanted to. And it was a staggering experience to walk through this. Well, it was long enough to really begin to think, well, how do they now live in a style of that making? I don't know what their private quarters are like, but the uh, where we could be was fantastic, really. And there's a picture which I couldn't bring of the present Earl, looking over the banisters at his vast possessions, if they're still his, I don't know. Quite modern man, not at all impressive, and not, not actually even like the portraits of his forefathers. But, uh, and the program at Sion Park is a modern program. It's made ample use of old inherited goods in our present uh, culture. And that is fine, I find, a very striking thing. Um, now, to start with the theme, or more closely with the theme, it is about becoming individual, differentiating from the people, but not cutting off from the people. And Jung makes this very clear. And I would add, or say, and I will probably repeat myself intentionally, that this is not saying you have to be a Jungian, you have to be in analysis, you have to be in therapy with a Jungian, and you have to suffer uh, through another and yourself. This is accessible to anybody who is interested in becoming themselves. And it can be applied. If I sound as though you have to be a Jungian, well, I. Many of my insights have come through my practicing, training and practicing in this particular discipline, but by no means all of them. I'll give you three definitions of um, individual and individuating. One is, the first one is from Jung, uh, Volume 6, Psychological Types, paragraph 756. By individuality, I mean the peculiarity and singularity of the individual in every psychological respect. And there I need to remind myself and tell you that when Jung uses the word anything to do with psyche, he does mean the whole, the person. He makes that very clear in one of his uh, volumes. He doesn't make it quite so clear in other volumes. And so we get shifted from the wholeness of a person, or man and woman, to a part, what we call the psyche. It is not like that. It's the whole person. In par paragraph 757, the one following the one I've just read, uh, these are extracts, not the whole paragraph. It's written volumes, really. Individuation, therefore, and that is the process in which we are involved willy-nilly. It's part of our organic life. Individuation, therefore, is a process of differentiation having for its goal the development of the individual personality. It is to some extent opposed to collective norms. And in paragraph 789, which is on the self, these are come under the uh, labelling of definitions in volume 6. The self is an empirical concept the self designates the whole range of psychic phenomena in men, I added woman, because when he says men, oh, it's a bit difficult, but he did mean people, <laughs> men and women. <laughs> no, he did not mean men and women, because that's people. He meant man and woman, the individual. Now, an additional help in, under in following this 
It comes from the critical <coughs> dictionary of Jungian analysis for Samuel Shorter and Plout, three Jungian analysts, Samuels from here, Shorter, Zurich trained and now in Scotland, and Plout uh, used to be here and is working now chiefly in Berlin. And there again, it's an extract of what they say, and a very long and very interesting commentary, really, on this process. The key concept in Jung's contribution to the theories of personality development is a person's becoming himself whole, indivisible, and distinct from other people, or collective psychology, though also in relation to it. Uh, this is illustrated by an example which he frequently gives, refers to a saint, a Swiss saint, Nicolas von der Flu, who after a full life with family and friends and profession, though I don't remember what it was, decided that he must go apart to develop himself. And so his family and his friends and his colleagues gave him permission to retire to the forest and live as a hermit. It didn't work for him. And strangely enough, the uh, people at whom he'd left uh, somehow tuned in on this <laughs> and came to live next to him. <laughs> so there was an involuntary or voluntary move towards a small community and I, as far as I know there's quite a lot written about him as far as I can gather they all benefited by this uh, move away from what the man originally wanted but towards the goal of becoming <coughs> individuals and there's one comment that I will add which I tend to forget about it is, of course, not only Jungians who have the chance of individuating. It is Jung who expressed the goal of becoming an individual through or being involved in the individuation process. We can't escape it. It's part of our lives. But we can enhance it and we can further our development by in certain ways. Now the third thing I want to say, and that may interest people more who are interested in the Holocaust and what Elmsen but Rafael Lopez Petraza, a South American <laughs> Jungian of, of Spanish origin originally, calls after the catastrophe Anselm Kiefer, the book is only just, I think, appeared in the shops. At least I, I found it a few weeks ago. Um, it's, it's a 1996, I think, um, publication. And Anselm Kiefer is an artist in Germany who came to the realization that the nation carried an enormous amount of guilt which had not been processed shame as well, but mostly guilt. And he himself felt that he suffered from something he could not really get a hold of, nor could others. Well, this is something that I certainly lived with and worked through the 10 years that I went to Germany twice a year in this, uh, with a team of, we were a team of four, um, teaching a Fuchs's method of uh, group analysis. Mm -hmm. And as we had no given theme, in fact, the Holocaust became the theme. But this is something very much more sophisticated and deep, uh, with greater, far greater insight than I would, I would say that we had, although we talked about the theme. And this man, who is not a Jungian, the, the book is by a Jungian, but Kiefer is not a Jungian, gives one of the best descriptions of one of the ways in which we uh, can help ourselves to becoming ourselves, which is called in Jungian jargon um, active imagination, which is not an esoteric exercise. It is something very practical, 
but very difficult. And it is not the same as guided imagination, but they are not that dissimilar. Active imagination means a dialogue between the self and whatever the self is engaged in. Mostly we think of it in the, in the realm of painting, but it, it's, it's exercised in any of the realms which are dictated to us by our five senses. And his definition, you can look at this, it's fantastic. What he did was, he had himself, he put himself in the posture with the gesture of the Zeke Heil, Heil Hitler, which became the greeting, universal greeting after 1933. If you didn't, you'll get into trouble. He did this and had himself photographed. And through the photograph of himself in that position, which was no longer his position, he's three generations, 46, we're now 97. Uh, later, he's, I think, in his 40s. He learnt a great deal about himself, which uh, um, Pedroza Lopez then describes and analyzes. It's a fantastic book, which I've only just begun to read. But his insight came by putting himself in the position and in the environment of the 1933 to 19. 40, let's say 46, um, atmosphere, hmm, well, it's rather a mild word for what it was, um, in Germany. So even if you're not interested in the Holocaust or after the catastrophe, it is worth looking at the book anyhow. It's not cheap, but it's not desperately expensive either. And it's an example of how people... <laughs> who don't know our jargon, who don't know our, by our I mean Jungian practices, come themselves to a method which Jung described. As somebody said to me this morning, I was at another uh, half a, half a conference, uh, we talked about Jung, he said, well, Jung, of course, <coughs> only collected what other people had already said. I think that's an exaggeration, but he did do quite a lot of collecting of <laughs> what other people said, but looked at them in a different light. Uh, that doesn't belittle Jung in, at all. Uh, on the contrary, it's putting him in the environment out of which he came. Mm -hmm. And it is important to realize that. Mm -hmm. About, uh, from this book, just a few quotations. But we started at three. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, <coughs> the author, uh, our author, which is the uh, South American analyst, Jungian, shows how Kiefer's work explores the deepest venues of psychology and in so doing it nourishes our passions for both self-knowledge and artistic expression. And I was mightily glad to find the word passion, because I think without it, this work it cannot be. Now, fairy tales have crept into the use of Jungians, not only Jungians, but of Jungians, quite some time ago. Um, use in therapy. Uh, it's now widely used, not only by Jungians, in groups or individually, to try and gain an understanding of uh, the underlying layers of ourselves and to find a way in which we don't, in, to find a way to understand our own inner world. And it's very similar to treat one way of looking at dreams, which is that whatever is, whoever is dreamt of exists in their own right but they reflect our own inner world. So if we think about what a person or an event or a thing means to us when it crops up in a dream, it can tell us about ourselves. It's similar, but not quite as expressive as standing up on wherever he's standing with the Heil Hitler. Um, 
one, one warning before I go on to actually look at a fairy tale is that identification with the figures, which is sometimes inevitable if it's a very moving theme, does not help us towards change of ourselves. But it does help us to understand the underlying structure which is part of our personality, but it's part of that which influences our development from, as you might say, inside. Just as we also know and well aware of the fact how influenced we are from every event that is going on around us, including people. Is that sort of fairly clear? I, I'm rather uh, condensing things. Um, so the trick is to to enter this exercise of uh, uh, fairy tale work as uh, relaxed as possible, and some people actually introduce a relaxation exercise before they sit down to listen. As I say, I found a practical. I was uh, became more convinced of a necessity to shed external clothes, I might say, metaphorically speaking, to try and shed some well-formed attitudes, as for instance about art. <laughs> I would never have dreamt possible that I would have dreamt that I could get a lot of meaning and energy from these uh, products of two people's hands. This incidentally is, I think, 13th century. It's the church. This belongs to the church. It shows another individual expression of that time. It's very, it's very, very interesting. So the story I've okay, chosen. Just, just before you go on to the fairy tale, can I can I take up what you said about um, the identification yes, with with a person? Because you said, did people understand? Well, the and that sort of focused my mind in, do I understand? Yeah. And. Uh, if I can just play it back to you, what, how I understand it, what and I'm you saying, can say whether yes. that's whether whether I'm understanding you right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, that that if we that we're likely to identify with one of the characters or maybe more in the story, because that's our own, if you like, preset pattern. Cinderella, but, for instance. Cinderella, for instance. But but that that's actually not the most. Not helpful, the most useful. The most way. helpful way to respond to the story no. as a whole, because all the people in the story are, are can we can experience them as representing yes. different aspects of ourselves. Yes. So it's a kind of we're likely to identify, sort of focus in on one yes. character, but it's better to try and float a bit. It's better free. to try and be free floating yeah. and first take the whole story as though you were looking at a film. Though I know even in a film one can get caught by one mm. particular thing. And then, usually, the story is read again, or part of the story is read again, and the invitation is to choose a figure and live as consciously as one can with that figure through the story. And the third invitation, though we, we differ there, I would say my third invitation, but I must say with the time that we have, I really rarely get to it. <laughs> and the third <laughs> invitation is to write your own story from the figure that you have decided to be. So you may come to a totally different solution of the theme. <laughs> Which indeed is what we do with the traditional <coughs> fairy tale, because uh, it's not much point thinking that, like Cinderella, you will finally, uh, because the prince is so, so um, insistent on finding the foot that fits the shoe, that just without any effort of yourself, of ourselves, we find the prince finds us, and everything is. Uh, we live happily ever after. That is not the human situation. <laughs> we always hope. Well, <laughs> I would question that. We can hope. Yes. We'll question that. <laughs> you mean now it's the lottery <coughs> with the prince? Yes. Um, 321. This story is written by a man called Philip Dick. He's a contemporary, no, he, he died in the 80s. He was, uh, he's our, part of our lives, American. 
Apparently he was considered to be one of the best science fiction writers when uh, the beginning of science fiction writing. Rather like Le Guin, or Gwyn, how is she's pronounced. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, uh, roughly at the same time, I think. And the story is called um, The King of the Elves. Now, I wouldn't blame you at all if you said, what on earth is this woman doing? Elves, well, maybe when I was six I believed in them. And with elves come trolls, and we're not Scandinavians. And even if we were, I'm not sure they still have trolls. Anyhow, this is the story. And I can't read the whole of it uh, to you because that would uh, really take too long. But I'll pick out, I have tried to pick out the essential um, features. This story happens in, in, a, in a place that's cut off from the mainstream, though the motorway, or something next to a motorway, still ran through it. And it had a, a constant population which neither seemed to grow nor to decrease. Um, the two main fi- people in the story are two men. It's only got men in it. Uh, well, men and elves and trolls. Um, uh, the, the, the two chief men are a man called Shadrach and 321 and the years. Shadrach has an old tumble-down gasoline station, petrol station, and workshop, um, which he ser- from which he serves the odd car that stops. Um, Hanias comes in later. So the story starts with uh, Shadrach in his uh, um, rather shabby uh, station. Uh, uh, it's a rotten night, it's raining, and it's getting dark and sheets of water blew along the row of pumps at the edge of the filling station. Ideally, one should not read the story. We all know this. But I'm afraid I can't, couldn't reach the ideal, so I have to read some of it. And this man stood just inside the doorway of this little building and considered the night. And then he decided that he would shut it up. But suddenly the bell rang, and so he went out and uh, wondered who on earth was there, because he couldn't see a car, nor could he see anybody. But as he looked a little longer, he saw a little creature, a small creature, and several creatures standing beside the pump. And two little figures, tiny figures, dripping wet and their glorious clothes. Well, he thought they were once glorious, also dripping wet, the, the wind blowing around them, water streaking down their tiny faces, were carrying a platform. And on that platform, there was something that stirred and a small head turned wearily towards Shadra, peering at him. And in the dim light, a rain-streaked helmet glinted dully. And who are you? Shadra said. And the figure on the platform raised itself up and said, I am the king of the elves, and I am wet. Shadra stared in astonishment. That's right, said one of the bearers. We are all wet and cold. The king of the elves, he said, Shadra said, well, I'll be darned. Could that be true? Well, whatever you are, he said to them, you shouldn't be out on the night like this. So if you'll come with me, 
the elves agreed, of course not, but still there it was. And they explained how they got there. They'd lost their way in the forest on their way home, and they realized that the trolls were after them. And the trolls and the elves have a troublesome existence. They uh, fight each other. Usually, apparently, the trolls win. But what's much worse than trolls winning is apparently that they are surrounded by a terrible stench. And the elves couldn't stand that. Apparently they just can't stand it. So they tried to get away from them and then found themselves on the highway and they found themselves at the gasoline station. So Shedra said, all right, I'll go home and get the fire started and you'll follow me. Home was just a few steps up the road. So he invited them in and he gave them hot chocolate and the elf king felt a bit better and actually snored. <coughs> However, he woke up and he said, I'm sorry, I must have drifted off. Where was I? And one of his soldiers said sleepily, you should retire, your majesty. It is late and these are hard times. True, said the elf king, nodding. Very true. And he looked up at the showering, at, I'm sorry, at the towering figure of Shadrach standing there before the fireplace with a glass of beer in his hands. Mortal, we thank you for your hospitality. Normally, we do not impose on human beings. It's those trolls, another of the soldiers said, curled up on a cushion off the couch. Yes, that's right, another soldier agreed. Those reeking trolls, digging and croaking. So they once more described their dilemma, and Shadrach tried to correct them in their geog geography using his names for the countryside, but they insisted on their names for the countryside. So for them, the highway was the endless path. It had no end. So, we thank you for taking us in. And then he coughed. And the elves again, the other elves, I mean, became very apprehensive and drew near to their king. And one of them said, He has to rest. Where's your room? The sleeping room. Upstairs, Shadrach said. I'll show you where. And so he showed them up to his sleeping room. And when Shadrach finally settled down downstairs, he said, I can't be elves, trolls, a king. He laughed in embarrassment. What was the matter with him believing all this? He put his cigar out angrily, his ears red, what was going on? What kind of joke was this? And finally, he went upstairs because, well, I don't know what because, doesn't say so. But as he went upstairs, he met on the stairs two elves. The light had suddenly gone out too. The doors, the two elves had come halfway down the stairs. And they looked at him, and they looked sad. What's the matter? he asked. They did not answer. What is it? And it got very cold inside. Somehow the chill of the unknown was penetrating his body. What is it? What's the matter? The king is dead, one of the elves said. He died a few moments ago. Shadrach stared up wide-eyed. He did? Well, you see, he was very cold and very tired. And the elves turned round and went back into the room and quietly shut the door. And Shadrach came downstairs and he nodded his head blankly and he said, I see. I see, he said to the closed door. He's dead. And then the next thing was that the elf soldiers had come downstairs and stood around him in a solemn circle. 
They wanted to talk to him. And he said, wait, I've got a job to do. Look, there's a car drawing up. Well, you have to wait. We want to talk to you. He, oh, well, listen, one of them said. Please hear us out. It is very important to us. And Shadrach looked past them and thought, well, all right, the day's money will be less. So, these worried little <coughs> people, in their still rather bedraggled clothes, stood next to him, and one of them told him the story. They were whispering amongst themselves, and Shadrach waited. You see, they said, or one of them said, we cannot be without a king. We could not survive, not these days. The trolls, another one added, they multiply very fast. They're terrible beasts. They're heavy and ponderous, crude and bad smelling. The odour of them is awful. Well, said Shadrach, you ought to elect a king then. I don't see any problem there. We do not elect the king of the elves, the soldier said. The old king must name his successor. Oh, Shadrach replied, well, there's nothing wrong with that method, is there? Well, as our old king lay dying, a few distant words came forth from his mouth, his lips. And we went closer, frightened and unhappy, and listened. Well, that's important, all right. Of course, you didn't want to miss anything, did you? Well, he spoke the name of him who will lead us. Good. You caught it then. Well, where's the difficulty? Uh, the name he spoke was um, was your name. Shadrach stared. Mine? The dying king said, Make him the towering mortal your king. Many things will come of it if he leads the elves into battle against the trolls. I see the rising once again of the elf empire as it was in the old days as it was before. At that moment, Shadrach leaped up. He'd suddenly understood something. Me? King of the Elves? King of the Elves? He grinned a little. I'm sure I never thought of it before. And he went to the mirror to look at himself. He saw himself. King of the Elves? Wait till Phineas, that's his friend, hears about this. Wait till I tell him. So the elves, delighted, went off, knowing they had a king, a mortal king. And then Shadrach, very naively, told his friend, Phineas, who had come to get some uh, petrol, about this. He said, you see, I am now king of the elves. And the other man gazed at him and said, how long have you been uh, king of the elves? <laughs> <laughs> Since the night before last. I see. Hmm. Well, and what, may I ask, occurred the night before last? The elves came to my house, and when the old king died, he told them... Hmm. Well, said Phineas, I must go. Perhaps we can talk about it tonight. And then one after the other, the people who lived close to Shadrach and had heard already about this <laughs> event, came to him and said, Shadrach, uh, tell us what, what's been going on. Are you sure that you are now the king of the elves? Yes, I am the king of the elves. And anyone who says I'm not, all right, all right, all right, he said, starting up the car quickly. Don't get mad, I was just wondering. All right, said Dan. And so they came to the conclusion that Chedra really believed that he was now the king of the elves. And that night he was once more at the filling... 
Oh, Lord, yes. At the filling station, and an elf came up and told him that as a king of the elves, he was now to meet them in the field, which belonged actually to Pioneers, his friend, at midnight. And so he made a move to do that. And Shadrach was cold, and Phineas was anxious and urged him to come and have a drink with him. And he did, and he enjoyed the coffee. And then he said, I must go. And so they both went outside, and Phineas put his hand on the arm of the other. <coughs> yes, you'd better go home. It's cold and it's late. And we'll talk another time. And at that very moment, Shedra saw something very odd. He looked at the hand on his arm and he found that it was wrinkled, huge, rough and coloured and the fingers were blunt and the nails were broken and cracked. And he looked at the and he found that he was no longer the man he knew. He had short and squat, and ugly, and worst of all, he smelt. And then he began to smell a rat, I mean Shadra, and went to an old barrel and uh, loosened one of the uh, rings around the barrel and attacked Phineas. And Phineas roared and up came a horde of trolls from underneath the house and from the country around. And Shadrach beat them all with his, beat them off. They, they clawed onto him, they did everything we imagined trolls would do. And then suddenly there was a clarion call from the distance and the elves arrived in orderly formation. And there was a battle to the death of the trolls, at the end of which the elves rather the worse for wear, but none of them wounded and none of them lost by death, stood around the king of the elves. And then they said, look, something else you've done. And they looked at the corpse on the ground, which was Phineas, and they opened his uh, jacket, and under the jacket they found uh, an armour, and under the armour they found a tattoo mark, which indicated that he was the king of the trolls. So the elves had finally won the battle, and Shadrach, the king of the elves, had killed the king of the trolls. Well, there was one final attempt that Shadrach made to to escape his fate as king of the elves. He said, now that we've won the battle, I can go home, can't I? Oh no, they said. Oh yes, they said, I'm so sorry. Oh yes, they said, and they turned their back on him and got their things together. And Shadrach turned his back on them and waved goodbye. But he could not go. Oh, I've got a handkerchief. <laughs> but he could not go. He turned back, he found the elves waiting for him. He said, I am the king of the elves. Of course I don't leave you. I will come with you and we will go and plan the future. So they arrived with a big platform this time, big enough, <laughs> big enough to carry him. And he mounted it. It was far more uncomfortable than far less comfortable than walking. And off they went, the whole army, happily this time, to the kingdom of the elves. Well, I'll leave you with this. Um, treat it with respect. Mm -hmm. See whether you think, like Shadrach, this can't be true, it can't be of any use, I'm not the king of the elves. Mm -hmm. And remember, I would ask you that you can treat it like a dream.
I would suggest you treat it like a dream. All the creatures who appear and all the events appear are those which appear in your own, in our own inner world. I found that when I really began to reflect on this, not think about it, logic is no good. It's right brain activity, not left brain activity. An enormous amount came out of it for me. I hope it will for you. Mm. Now, where may I go? <laughs> <laughs> on, on the... Uh, <laughs> uh, do we come back in here for no, tea? We, we, stay, we stay now. I stay too? Yes, please. Oh, I see. Um, um, I thought I was being released. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you have to stay and be king of the realm. So. Oh. Um. But it's up to you, isn't it? <coughs> yes. Oh, I, well, what I'd like to do is just give everybody a minute or two, as Johanna said, to reflect and, and just let the images and, and the, the feelings that have arisen in you as, as you've been listening to the tale just, you know, move around in, in your minds and, and then perhaps we can start our discussion out of that or anything else from the talk that you want to. But I will give us just a couple of minutes because I think we need it. Mm -hmm. I left out the most important... Uh, at least one of the most important things, when he asked, um, why am I to be, why did he choose me mm -hmm. to be the king of the elves? I, at least I don't think I said it. He said, he chose you because you took us in, you asked for no reward, you gave us your bed, you gave us your food, you gave us your room, and you asked for nothing in return. Let, let, let's pick up then, either from the tale itself or from anything else, else that Johanna was talk, saying earlier in her talk. Where would you like to start? And I guess that everybody's feelings around the story are going to be very different, and my own is, is that of reluctance. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, there's this, this man who does this, the kindly gesture and he doesn't ask for anything and he gets, as it were, clobbered with being king of the elves <laughs> and, um, you know, he, his reluctance to believe in them and, and he's going to march upstairs and give them what for, it sounded like. But, yes. um, he's overtaken by the events <coughs> in, in the elves' world and, and, and his world then gets, gets caught up in it. But it, it was the reluctance, I think, that... Um, that I felt, which is clearly a statement about my psyche. <laughs> but it was rather like what you were saying about um, Nicholas of Flew, wasn't yes. it? That that that. Um, that he did what he thought he wanted to do, but, mm. but in fact it didn't work out that way. No, he had to follow. Um. The small group to wh with, whom, with whom we read it uh, did much the same as you're doing. There was mm. what to do with it. And uh, I felt rather like you like, uh, expressed, no. <laughs> <laughs> No way. Mm. And when it came to the trolls, I thought, well, certainly no way. Mm. <laughs> Never bad smelling. Mm. 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 But at least it's very clear who's who. You know, I mean, the, the, the elves are elves and the trolls are bad smelling, so you, at least you can tell who they are. Mm. Um, except, of course, Phineas, that, you, Until that, that he, didn't, he didn't know. She didn't know that Phineas was the king of the trolls. What stood out for me was, was the sense of great relief that it was all the trolls' fault. Mm. You know, so it's just nice to be an owl and actually know it was all the trolls. Mm. He was great. That was the point for me that stood stayed with me. Was this very nice feeling? You know, actually, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the clarity of the good is and the bad is. I, the reason why I chose it, if that's any, any help or any use, is that it is really, in my experience anyhow, 
I wouldn't even say virtually impossible, but impossible to to understand this level at which the two morality on the one hand and brutality on the other, or you can say good and evil, actually happen. We may see the effects of it, but to actually experience it or see it, experiencing we can do, but to actually begin to use it is, I think, impossible without some help. Um, and fairy tale, or I like, don't want to call it that, call it what you like, doesn't help every. isn't of use to everybody. So it may hit some of you as, you know, what's the use of that? But um, if you can relate to it on that level, that it's, it's giving an actual description of um, a battle, which I think we all do know about. Um, then maybe you can find, even in the short time which I've given you, to um, reflect in words. I mean, it might be easier to reflect with paint, but we can't do that. Mm. I mean, here today, we are limited to silence or words, mm. or gesture. I'm sorry, outer silence, I would say. I mean, uh, the inner world has its own language. It sounds as if they should be. But the, na the names are significant of, of things. Well, that's what we thought, but we couldn't. We ha I haven't got to a dictionary of names. The shade right, the um, fiery furnace, which I'm yeah. in Nebuchadnezzar, yeah. popped here. Belongs there, does it? A couple of other chaps in. Uh -huh. yeah, so purificatory sort of experience. I think, is it Daniel? Rescue? Daniel 3. Daniel 3. Mm. Yes. Well, it wasn't meant for purification. It was meant to uh, kill. Yes, but it didn't. It, it, it didn't, didn't heal. It didn't kill. No. Yeah. But finally, as I couldn't find, I mean, Shadra has been, was suggested, that, that meaning. Finally, as we couldn't find, if anybody knows, the rang slightly familiar, but I couldn't place it. But does anybody know? Does anybody have associations to, to Phineas or...? Um, there's a character in Trollope called Finn. Trollope? Finn, mm -hmm. Finn, yeah, Finn. What's he like? Uh-huh. He's Irish, I think. Uh -huh. um, and he's a lieutenant of the Irish Member of Parliament, if I remember it. He's attracted to William. Attracted to William? Long time since I've read. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't Phineas Fogg the man who goes around the world in 80 days? Yes, you're quite right. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Uh, Jules Byrne. Mm -hmm. Around the world in 80 days. Somebody suggested Tolkien as someone to compare it with. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, that is where you still find elves today. Yes. Mm. In the patient culture. Yes. Mm. I was interested in your comment about trolls, if I heard you right. Trolls uh, no longer existing in Scandinavia. I said I wondered whether they did. I have no oh, Scandinavian con contacts. Well, I'm a Norwegian American and they do exist. For they me. do exist. Yes. and. Uh, in fact, they really were brought alive for me in hearing a story, and I um, I remembered some stories that my grandmother told me about the trolls. And uh, on a visit to Norway, I got some books, story books about trolls to read to my children, and we talked about trolls. And um, I mean, a troll could be anybody amongst us, in fact, wandering out from the forest. <laughs> Mm. It's as easy as that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, well, that's what seems disturbing about Pioneer, isn't it? That he was actually the friend. Mm. And mm -hmm. in my mind, he sort of became the best friend, so he had to kill his <laughs> best friend. And mm. that seemed disturbing to me. Mm. Well, isn't he a shadow? Mm. 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 But you wouldn't mm. expect your best friend to be. 
your enemy, you could easily imagine being your shadow. <coughs> You haven't seen Donny Brasco written, which, <laughs> <laughs> no, and, which is a new film about the Mafia, about the FBI infiltrating the Mafia, and these two men, one a mafiosi and one an FBI man, who become the most close friends, friends. and like a father and son, and mm -hmm. then the FBI man has to, or the mafiosi has to be killed. Perhaps the elves are like the FBI. Did you say the elves are like the FBI? Yeah. Well. <laughs> you don't believe in the But it's interesting what you say there about about seeing the same archetypal motif about the the, the shadow in the best friend or or or, or, or the deceit disguise whatever yes. you call it and and this is what you were saying wasn't it about the troll can be anybody coming mm. in <coughs> from the forest and then just sitting among us now what you know <laughs> but I mean this is what you're saying isn't it? absolutely yes. and, and, and this is this is how the story is too the, the best friends the people who do things together so could, could you could you speak up a bit so the people yes I'll try thank you um, it seems that Phineas is more a representative of the collective mm -hmm. the, the, the common sense proper ordinary way of thinking and it's so difficult to um, for a Shadrach to allow himself to be an elf, which he obviously really is. Uh, but he only recognizes himself as an elf when he sees his friend as a troll. Oh. And then he can accept being a king of the elves. Mm. So he can't part, can he? He can't leave them, in fact. He, he goes about as if he's going to. And the elves don't leave either. He's drawn unconsciously. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. were, were you able to hear? Yes. There's some equation of individuation and becoming a king. I mean, presumably somebody wake up and find themselves elves rather than the king of the elves. I don't know. That's my theory. <laughs> that you'd wake up and find yourself an elf, but not the king of the elves. Uh -huh. <laughs> 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 well, we can't all be king of the elves. Ex except in so far as, as, as picking up what Johanna was saying about dream interpretation, in so far as everybody in the story is part of us. So then, then we're both, we can be both the king and also all the little soldier elves as well. Mm -hmm. The bad smell seems a very potent symbol. Mm. Um, you know, we, now we're all civilized, we wear deodorants, and so <coughs> in a sense it's, it's a, a more primitive self, and indeed the trolls when described have a you know, sort of calloused hand with broken fingernails, and it seems to me that um, you know, in a way the elves are perhaps, you know, the civilized people who don't have B.O., whereas the poor old trolls are the lump and proletariat with uh, <laughs> broken fingernails and, uh, and, and a bad smell. And yeah, just in a way, the king was a very unlikely person because he was a garage man. I think he was quite a good smuggler as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> and I think that's something that struck me in the story that, in a way, he was very, he was a surprising person. Which one? 
掉了，废纸。Because he was a garage owner and, and a very ordinary in that sense yes. mm -hmm. sort, yes. sort of person, as you say, perhaps dirty himself and with dirty hands from the from the work and so on. Yeah. Mm -hmm.